Okay, so for the most part, uh, I just want you guys to work through your uh, the lab too uh, on your own, but I just wanted to sort of do a quick crash course in some of the skills that you need to get through it. So I'm in R Studio, uh, and I'm going to open up a new R script, and I'm just going to write a note and just call it um, skills for lab two. Um, so I think you guys all need to know how to set your working drive for this uh, for this lab. So um, who who here knows already how to set the working drive from R Studio? Yep. How do I do it? Tilda? Squiggly line? Yeah, yeah. And then map slash. And then documents. And then it just depends on what other folder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent answer. So, and for most people here who are working on Macs, this, the tilde replaces um, users and then your username. So, if you just use the tilde, I think we could do it either way. Um, and you don't necessarily need documents either. So if I just wanted to set my working drive to the desktop, uh, that would accomplish it. And then I could say, just a good way of testing if you've set your working drive correctly is just get, get WD. So you see how it's, it tells me that my working drive is users, Paul Connor, desktop. Really, the, so the tilde has replaced that. And I could have typed all that out. Um, oh, no, not in that one. I could have done set WD and then users for Connor. And then one really useful thing is to use the tab key. So it knows that I want to go to users, it knows that I want to go to Paul Connor. And if I put my cursor here and press tab, it gives me all the possible options for now where I can set the um, set the working drive to. So I can click on desktop and set the working drive like that. Now for um, for PCs, it's slightly different, um, and I don't use a PC, so I'm not totally up on what you have to do, but could somebody with a PC tell me, like, what's the difference on a PC in setting our working drive? PC and That's right, isn't it? Yeah. So it'd be set WD, and then it'd go C col oh, colon, and then slash? Uh, yeah, slash. Slash. And does the tab key work in the same way? So if you just go C colon slash and press tab key, do you get the options of where you can? Okay, maybe not. All right. Um, okay. So that's uh, how you set your working drive. So, Julian? How easy do you get the user tab key um, without typing the name? Sorry, how do you the way you do The users and stuff? Uh, let me think. So, if I just do tab, um, it doesn't really give me those options. Um, well, I actually just did get working drive and I copied and pasted it. Um, but if you just do use the tilde, um, and then the tab, it's sort of already replaced yeah, yeah. users and then my, my name. So I just want to set it to the desktop and then get working drive. We'll check where your working drive is. Um, and if it tells you that it can't, if it gives you an error when you're trying to set the working drive, there's probably a, a problem with the path. Um, like you're trying to set to a folder that is not where you're telling R it is or something like that. Um, okay, so this is Windows to check. Okay, so the next skill um, is loading a CSV file uh, into R. So who knows how to do this? Yeah? What is it? Oh, yeah.
-hmm. In the name of the Father, right. So tab key will work in this context too. So like now that I am inside the quotation marks inside read CSV, I can press tab and it'll tell me all the possible uh, files that I can load. Uh, I don't actually have a CSV on my desktop right now, but let me just maybe find one. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's maybe, what CSV? Uh, there was one. Uh, all right, I think this is from an old version of this class. So I'm just gonna copy this onto my desktop. To Google for school.csv. I don't know if Daniel's using the same one this semester, but now that I have a CSV on my desktop, I can press tab, I find it, and I load it, and I can see that, yeah, it's loaded into my environment, and I've got that 5,738 observations of 13 variables. So um, this command should be the same on Mac or PC. How did you search for it again? So I'm just uh, pressing tab once I'm inside those quotation marks. I think I have to be inside the quotation marks, yeah. Um, otherwise it's gonna go file equals, yeah, no. So yeah, quotation marks, too cool for school. Or I could have just typed out the name. The tab is useful though because you don't have to worry about spelling the name of the file correctly and it'll actually show you if that file's really there or not. Uh, so it can be useful. So loading a CSV file into R. And we could have called it anything. Uh, we decided to call it dat, but you could call it whatever you wanted. My awesome data file. You might want to keep those names uh, short though. Um, just because you don't have to type that out again and again. And you don't want your lines to get too long either. So, ah, here's another skill, removing a file from the environment. It's just rm parenthesis, the name of the file you want to remove. So if I run that, my awesome data file vanished um, from the environment. If I run it again, I'll get an error. It says, you're trying to remove a file, that file's not even there. Um, so yeah, cool. So from memory lab two, you need to do a few more things. Like um, one of them is um, calling a specific variable from a data frame. Oh yeah, so at the moment that is a data frame, uh, which is a kind of object in R. Um, and if you wanna find out what kind of object an object is, you can just ask, ask R to tell you. So like um, finding what kind of object something is, that's just gonna be class and then the name of the object that you're interested in. Um, so we can see here it's telling us that that is a data frame. And so R has all sorts of different kinds of objects and you can do different things with different kinds of objects. Uh, you guys will mostly work with data frames and maybe vectors, but we'll see. Uh, it's probably mostly you'll be working with data frames. So calling a specific variable from a data frame. So I know that that has 13 variables. Actually, maybe like before we even do that, um, how to tell how many rows and columns in a data frame. Um, do you guys know this? Okay. Have you been shown the command for accessing how many rows? So generally we have participants as rows. That's the normal format of a data frame. Not always like that. Um, some data frames you'll have multiple rows for the same participant, but in this case, one row is one person. So how would I find out how many rows are in this data frame? What's that? N row, awesome. 
So n row, and then what? What's that? The data set? Yeah. N row dot? Ah, parentheses. Exactly. Every function needs to be followed by parentheses. Um, great. And that will be number of rows, hence n row. Okay, how about the number of columns? Yeah. Length, parentheses, dot. Nice. Length, parentheses, dot. And that is the number of columns. Now, somebody might say this is a waste of time. I can just look up here and see that it's 5,738 observations of 13 variables. And you'd be right, but in this course, we just need you to do it with code. And uh, it's very useful for a lot, in a lot of other contexts and purposes to be able to do it with code. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I think ncol works as well. Let me just check. ncol. Yeah. Also number of columns. Cool. Okay. Um, one of my favorite functions is uh, how to find the names of the variables in a data frame. Have you guys been shown that yet? Names, yeah. It's very intuitive. Uh, get names of variables. And it's actually, yeah, names parentheses dot. Well, tell me, these are the names. And this is a really, really useful function. You're going to use it all the time. Trust me. Um, so I can see, and just take a minute to notice the output here. So there's 13 names, right? Because we have 13 variables. Um, and obviously, cool1 is the first of those variables. Cool5 is the fifth. Coolness is the ninth. And age is the 13th. But notice how R doesn't give us a number for every single index, right? So if I wanted to know which was the third variable, I would just have to go, OK, 1, 2, 3. The third variable is cool3. Um, it only gives us the index number down the left-hand side. And that will depend actually just on how wide your output window is. Like if I ask for this again, now it's given me 1, 7, and 13, right? So it's just, if I make it very narrow, um, it gives me the number for all of them. So this is like, it's just a quirk of RStudio uh, and how it prints its output. It takes whatever room you give it. Uh, and it tries to use that efficiently. Okay, so I think now, now that we know the names of our variables, um, we can think about calling a specific variable. So say I want to look at coolness, the variable coolness, which I assume is an aggregate of all the cool variables. Um, how would I call this variable from the data frame? There's a few different ways, actually, to do this. Bracket, comma, nine. Yeah, that works. Um, and that works because we know that coolness is the ninth variable. And what we, what, um, sorry, I forgot your name. Naomi. So what Naomi's done is she's what we call indexing. And so indexing is done with square brackets. Uh, it's very important whether brackets are round or square. Uh, with, I guess they're not even, if they're round, we call them parentheses, not a bracket. So these are brackets, these are parentheses. When you use indexing, you use the brackets. Um, and the comma in this case is required because when we use indexing on a data frame, we have to tell R uh, which rows we want and which columns we want, right? So here, we've just left, it always goes rows, columns. Um, I always remember that by like Russell Crowe, RC. So you can come up with your own mnemonic for remembering that. But um, the rows come before the comma, 
and the columns come after the comma. In this case, we've got nothing before the comma, which means we want all the rows, and we've just got the number 9 after the comma, which means we want the ninth column. So calling that makes R give us every value for the ninth column, which happens to be the coolness variable. Um, so indexing a data frame, and then it's like rows, columns. So another way you can do it is just with the name of the variable. So we can use uh, indexing and then actually just type out coolness, and that'll give us the exact same thing. So you can use the number of the variable, but sometimes that can be a bit unreliable because the data set might change. And what number column? You might delete a column and it would become 8 or something like that. If you don't want to worry about thinking about what number variable this is, you can just type the name of it and it'll give you that. And the other way that's really common is with the dollar sign. Um, and this can be useful too. So if I do dollar sign, it then all the names of the variables appear. So I can just scroll down and choose the one that I'm interested in. So all of these things give us the exact same result. All these methods call the coolness variable. All right. So, okay, we're doing pretty good here. What if I want to call a specific row um, of a specific variable? What would I do? Probably not, because n row is just going to tell you the number of rows in the, yeah. So how would I look at, for example, the, the, tenth, the tenth person in the data set, their score on this coolness variable, if I just wanted to call that? Julian? Is it not going to say that and then Yeah, that'll work. Uh, so now, instead of having nothing before the comma, we've got the number 10 to specify we want the 10th row of the coolness variable. So yes, that will work. Um, also, that 10 comma 9 will work. Also, that dollar sign coolness brackets uh, 10 will work. Now, why don't I need a comma when I'm indexing here? Yeah, well, it's, it's the column. So I've already specified that I just want the coolness variable. So now the indexing, it doesn't really make sense to give it two numbers, right? Because the coolness variable itself is unidimensional, right? It's just a vector. So all I need is the number 10, uh, and that gives us that same value. So that's the tricky thing about indexing, is that you've got, really got to think about what you're indexing. If you're indexing something with two dimensions, you need two values, or you need the comma. If you're indexing something with only one dimension, you only need a, a single index. Um, so... Just from memory, like lab two, I'm thinking you need to be able to create uh, histograms. Creating histograms. Um, who knows what a what is a histogram? Just to start off. It's a graph. That's true. What kind of graph? It's a statistical graph. Awesome. So, like, do you want to draw a histogram for us? Yeah. 
Nice. Pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, so, say this is a histogram of age, for example. Um, and we had age like 19, 20, 21. Um, what would this tell us about the age variable, right? If we had a histogram that looked like this. The frequency of the Yeah, variable. exactly. So histograms plot the frequency of sort of different bins of a single variable. So most graphs you see uh, in psychology are not just of one variable. So histogram is a kind of weird case in that sense in which you're just graphing the distribution of one single variable. Um, the other, only other problem is that they're generally joined. And that's what that's how you sort of know you're looking at a histogram, is if the bars are actually joined to each other. Um, when they're separate, it's uh, more often called a bar graph. Um, and bar graphs can be very similar if what you're interested in is frequency. But they can be different as well. So, like, you can have a bar graph of a, some categorical variable that's plotting like means of different groups, like male, females, average height. That would be like a, a bar graph, right? Um, frequency uh, is different. So, yeah, that would be like a histogram, and this would sort of show us roughly that in our sample, um, 21 was the most common age. Uh, 19 was less common, 23 was less common, and we had nobody that was below 19 or above 23, uh, if we're imagining that that's our history. Cool. So, um, how do you create a histogram in R? Jesse? With hist and then... Hist and then... In quotes. Oh, well, like, you just... Uh, let's see. No. Uh, X must be numeric. So it's telling us that we didn't give it something numeric. So what should I do? How am I going to plot it? No, hist is the right command uh, for making a histogram, but we're not giving hist what hist, hist needs. It needs a variable, right? And we've given it a data frame. So how do we give it just a variable? Great. Exactly right. That's the simplest way to create a histogram of a variable. Um, and it shows us that we've chosen that coolness. It tells us it's a histogram of that coolness. It shows us the distribution. So most people scored around a three. Uh, we had very few people around a one and very few people around a five. And this is the frequency on the y-axis. So um, you also sort of need to know for the lab how to pimp out your histogram a little bit, uh, sort of change the colors of it, change the borders, uh, change the labels. That stuff, I'm just going to let you Google yourself. Um, like that stuff's all out there. And also, I mean, if you ask for help with hist, it's going to give you a lot of information about how to, well, it doesn't give you that. No, yeah, actually it does. So, for example, this is the help page of HIST. Um, and it's basically, it's giving you different possibilities of things that you can do. So, for example, see how it says, all these commands are sort of hidden at the moment, right? We're, not, we're only using one of them, which is X. That's the variable we want to make the histogram out of. But these are all possible things that we can include in this hist command to change our histogram. So, for example, I'll give you one of them, um, main. So main is, we can see that the default is to paste histogram of, and then the space, and then the name of our x variable, right? So we can see in our histogram that that's exactly what the title is, right? So that's the default. But, say we wanted to change the name, we would need to do something like hist of that coolness. And then we can say main. So main is like a command, right? So a lot of these functions have commands, possible commands that you can give the function. 
So main, I'm just going to call it my title. I run that, and you can see that I've changed the title. Um, so there is a different command to change the X label. There's a different command, and you always need commas, right, if you're going to add a new command to your graph. So there's a different command to change the label of the x-axis, the label of the y-axis, the color of the bars, the border color of the bars, um, how many breaks, so how many bins you put the, um, you put, so here we have, I think the default is like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's like eight, eight bins here, so you can change that to make it sort of finer grained or less fine grained, um, but I'll let you guys figure that out. Other than that, I think, that gives you guys a really good starting point to get through lab two. Um, perhaps there's some other tricky stuff that you'll come across. Uh, Google is your best friend, and I am also your next best friend. I will help if you put your hand up and you have a question or something. But yeah. Um, Definitely, if you kind of copied all this stuff, definitely save this script because uh, you need these skills not just for the lab but for the quiz as well on Monday. So, yeah, good luck.